Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 23rd of July 2021. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, QE money conjuring exposed, and we're going to talk about a new report by the Bank of England, one of the first uh, where parliaments are criticising the addiction of quantitative easing, and our weapon in the war on cash, where we'll discuss the fact that even the Reserve Bank of Australia admits that Australia's cash access is hinging upon Australia Post, and we'll talk about the worldwide moves towards public banking and postal banking. Uh, now, before we get started, don't forget to press the like button and subscribe to our channel. You can hit the notification bell to be notified of uh, shows as they're posted and also share this as widely as possible. Um, it's critical information we need to get out as far and wide as we can. So on to the first topic, QE money conjuring exposed. Um, so we're going to discuss a new uh, report from the House of Lords uh, called Quantitative Easing, a Dangerous Addiction, and also look at some parallels um, where this is being criticised in the United States and here in Australia. Uh, of course, the US Fed alone, according to the most comprehensive analysis that I've seen, uh, and this was done in 2011, so it's not the total, but uh, the Fed pumped out $29 trillion alone in quantitative easing. So if you think about what was pumped out by the, all the other large central banks in the world, the figure would be absolutely mind-boggling. So quantitative easing, Elisa, for the, not everyone just understands these terms, means that the banks, the central banks that have got the power, literally print money. Now, they can create that electronically, but a lot of them just print it and put it into circulation. And that means that we talk about turning the printing presses on to print mm. money. That's what we mean. This is mm. quantitative easing. Yeah, and what we'll talk about is the fact that it's not getting channelled into the real economy. So yeah. that's where it's creating problems. And a, a lot of people um, in the UK, where this House of Lords report was put together during the course of hearings and so forth, made the point that it was one thing to use it after the global financial crisis. I mean, we wouldn't have done it, but some of these other people in the banking fraternity say that was one thing. But... Um, they are uh, contesting the fact that it's continued to be used as a solution to virtually every problem. And in fact, it's got bigger and bigger, particularly in the March 2020 period after COVID hit, they used it as the basis for all of their interventions. And no one, no single government has actually stopped to analyse the impacts of that, the side effects of that until now. So there's a process in motion which is quite important. Um, and the report stated just a couple of the highlights um, so you know what's in it, that there is limited evidence that quantitative easing has increased bank lending investment or that it had increased consumer spending by asset holders. So in other words, it didn't flow through to the real economy. There's no evidence of that. And it said that furthermore, the policy has also had the effect of inflating asset prices artificially. And this has benefited those who own them, those assets, disproportionately exacerbating wealth inequalities. So, so we're, talking, we're talking about, look at the share markets, for example, and how the price of shares is going through the roof, or bonds and bond markets and so forth. The problem is that this money gets channeled in through the banks into these speculative instruments and the prices go up and up and up. So those who have got access to them, mm. you know, superannuation, superannuation funds and so forth, you know, they can speculate with this, but the average person... Yeah can't get access to it. Exactly. Nothing's improved on that front. Um, now, we'll put up a graphic um, showing the central bank balance sheets because um, since the global financial crisis, this bank, uh, House, of, House of Lords report pointed out, central banks have expanded their balance sheets by 10 trillion US dollars or 13% of global GDP. Um, and that uh, the increase since 2020 was 5.5 trillion, so over half of that. Um, so you can see there in the graph the, two, the increase from 2008, which is quite a sharp increase, but then, you know, and the constant growth since then, and then in that final little um, rise there at the end, that's the increase from 2020. Um, now, witnesses during the hearings pointed out a number of other important points. QE, they have said, has created an unhealthy codependency between central banks and markets. So the markets have become reliant on this these flows of money. You've created that addiction there. 
and that from March uh, 2020, three rounds of quantitative easing increased UK government debt owned by the Bank of England from 425 billion to 875 billion. Um, so that more than doubled. So you can see this reliance we've built into the system where we don't have any other approach to getting the economy moving again. Of course, we've got lots of ideas on that we'll come back to later. Um, but the report also said, or witnesses said, that the Bank of England is financing the government deficit. This is becoming an, a big issue now. Um, blurring monetary and fiscal policy, as they put it, and that QE is a no exit paradigm. So in other words, they have no plan and no government has ever successfully wound it back. Um, now I want to show a video at this point from Lord <coughs> Forsyth of Drumlean, who's an ex-investment banker being interviewed by uh, journal, British journalist Liam Halligan. And this Lord Forsyth of Drumlean, Craig, we refer to him all the time on the show because he was the uh, British politician and banker who said that um, you need laws like Glass-Steagall to prevent banks from speculating because if you don't ex absolutely exclude them from speculating, they'll get around it. Yeah, well, he actually made the point, there's this hilarious comment about bankers, particularly merchant bankers. He said, bankers are extremely adept at getting between the wallpaper and the wall. If they can find a way to get around something, they will. Well, just look at what's happened with the Banking Royal Commission. You know, we had these recommendations brought out, you know, then the government uh, has basically ignored them. Exactly. Right? The government, and at the insistence of the bankers, not just because the government's doing it of, of their own free will, because, you know, we know that the, the Morrison government is the tool for the bankers in this country when you go back and look at Morrison's history. At least at this point, I wanted to point, before we go to the video, I wanted to point that we, we've done a lot of work on this, uh, the subject of, of quantitative easing of bankers, what we call a banker's dictatorship, because that's what you're talking about here. And the quantitative easing is basically a process of protecting, or trying to protect, I should say, the banker's dictatorship. Because we've got policies like, for example, national banking, that can, you don't need to have quantitative easing, mm. uh, qualitative, quantitative easing, when you've got a policy of a, cent, of, of, of a national bank creating real credit and spending it in the economy. So we produced this uh, pamphlet, uh, it was actually a booklet back in uh, 2018. People can uh, call in and, and buy it, and it goes through, you know, the, for example, the British Crown and City of London Criminal Financial Empire, and we document just what we're talking about here. You've got actually criminal financial empire here, printing money, putting it into the to banking system in order to, to sustain or try and sustain their own criminal network. Mm. And this is what this is. We go through and document it in spades, and if people want to get a copy of that, if you want to know how to look at this question of what this, in what context this is happening. Have a look at this. The next financial crash is certain. End the Bank of England, Bank for International Settlements, Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, which is here in Australia, Bankers Dictatorship. Yeah. Right, time for Glass-Steagall Banking Separation and a National Bank. Mm -hmm. That's our policy document. And shows the real alternatives now. And this is, we're going to show this video clip of Lord Forsyth and Halligan, and they describe this as the biggest economic question facing the country and the world. And yet this is, isn't it, the first proper major independent investigation of quantitative easing in this country. Not just in this country. A policy which is arguably the most important and the most controversial economic policy of the last 10 years. Why is yours the first ever report? Well, um, interesting enough, when, when I suggested we might do that, a lot of people said, oh, well, it's very complicated and it's very technical and you'll get into an argument between new monetarists and Keynes and, and all of that. Actually, it's not very complicated no. at all. Um, it's common sense. To it's, uh, indeed. If you create loads more money, there's going to be lots of inflation. Yeah, and history tells us that lots of people have tried it and it always ends the same way. And um, uh, they always persuade themselves that this time it's different. Um, so there are huge there are huge dangers here. Um, that is not to say that quantitative easing after the financial crisis in two thousand and eight uh, was not a sensible uh, policy I agree. to introduce liquidity. But we but the reasons for quantitative easing and the scale of quantitative easing have changed as we go along the the the, the road, and that that that's what's concerning. And one has the impression that for the Bank of England now. Um, it's like watching somebody trying to play golf with only one club. I mean, every problem, every economic problem, the answer is QE. And Which is a very extreme emergency measure, right? Correct, yeah. But the emergency measures become a lifestyle choice. Yeah. I mean, that is the essence of an addiction. Mm. And so 
Um, we tried to produce a report, and as you say, I've got some real big brains on the committee. Uh, it's a unanimous report, There's no disagreement about it. Um, uh, we tried to produce a report which would explain to people who weren't, you know, brilliant um, economic journalists like you or economists or, or people, just right ordinary, ordinary folk that it would be accessible to them, or what are the issues here? What exactly is QE? Why are we doing it? What are the issues? What are the possible risks? And, and we really press the Bank of England to start answering the questions about why they did things and what the risks were. And, and they will have to respond to our report, the bank will have to respond, and the Treasury will have to respond to those parts which concern the Treasury. And then there will have to be a debate in, 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 in the House of Lords on the report and on their responses, which will probably be in the autumn, and I'm looking forward to that. It's hard to escape the, the conclusion that uh, this, I mean, I think is the biggest economic question facing our country, and indeed the world at the moment, is this use of quantitative easing and how, how we're going to unwind from it and how we avoid um, disaster. Now, the same debate is arising in the US and other countries as well. And I just want to put up a graph of the United States, which shows, um, well, it shows various um, lending from the EU and the UK and the US as well of quantitative easing. But then you'll see the red line at the bottom, which is bank lending, which you can see has actually gone down. So that's the funds going into the real economy through commercial bank lending. Um, and there's a, a new video that's been produced uh, a documentary by PBS Frontline called The Power of the Fed and this intersects some of these same issues as what have come up in this House of Lords report. So I want to show a couple of very brief clips from this just to give the flavour um, of the kinds of um, issues that are being hit here. So this first clip is uh, Mohammed El Arian who's from Allianz who also acted as an advisor to the US Fed on uh, QE, so it's very interesting therefore to see what he has to say in retrospect looking back at the policy. The Fed is the one institution that has a printing press in the basement and there's no limits to how much it can use. That is what makes the Fed such an influential player in the marketplace. Keep an eye on the Treasury market. Valerian's firm helped advise the Fed on its QE experiment. He told me the expectation was that the low interest rates and in QE would have a strong knock-on effect on the wider economy. That was the theory. In practice, the Fed was very successful in terms of moving asset prices. It was much less successful in moving the economy. And the result of that is we got the largest disconnect ever between Main Street and Wall Street, between the economy and finance. The banks are sitting on their butts and they're still not lending money. And until One of the problems was that the banks were holding on to a lot of the money instead of making it available to borrowers. And this next one's even more colourful and this is um, big time investor, in world famous Jeremy Grantham saying this. In my career in America, the percentage of GDP that goes to finance has gone from three and a half to eight and a half. We're in a way, we're like a giant bloodsucker, and we have more than doubled in size and sucking more than twice the blood out of the rest of the economy. And uh, we do not generate any widgets. We do not generate any, any real increase in income. We are just a cost. Now, the same debate uh, has also broken out in Australia, and we... Um uh, there's a number of MPs, and we've showed clips on this show in the past, people like um, One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts, Green Senator Nick McKim and LNP Senator Jared Rennick, who've been challenging the Reserve Bank on the fact they're pouring all this money into the financial markets, but yet they won't put anything into the real economy yeah. to boost infrastructure and so forth. And Guy DeBell from the RBA in a recent address uh, basically <laughs> admitted this to be the case and that the money, the QE money, is not being translated into the real economy because he admitted that the $188 billion term funding facility that was created by the government so that the banks would lend into the economy as part of the COVID-19 stimulus package is sitting idle in accounts at the Reserve Bank. So they're just, it's 
they've left it sitting there, they're paying 0.5% interest rate on it, but then at the same time they're using it, as Michael West pointed out on uh, his website, as collateral for overseas borrowing mm -hmm. so that they pump money into the housing bubble. This is exactly what the <laughs> banks do, Elise. I mean, uh, just quickly, if we go back into the 1930s, you had Ted Theodore, he was a treasurer at the time. Now, he wanted to create £18 million at that time of what's called uh, fiduciary note issue, which means that the notes would be literally created, but they wouldn't be backed by gold. He wanted to spend that money in supporting 50,000 workers in public works and West Australian farmers that were having a hard time. Spend it into the real economy. And the Commonwealth Bank, which was governed by the Bank of England at that point, said absolutely no. Mm. The fraud was the Bank of England at that time in the Depression was actually using quantitative easing and they produced something like 340 million pound mm. of uh, note issue, quantitative easing at that time. They said no to Australia, you can't do this. And that meant we had to suffer the depression, which we did not have to have. Mm. And uh, see, what I'm trying to, what I'm saying here is, this is a political tool to to maintain the status quo for the ruling dictatorship. And we go through that in our yeah, pamphlet. Yeah, because think. this system is collapsing, yep. and it is and this financial system which is the mechanism of control of what is essentially an informal financial empire, as we again point to in that exact document. Um, and you can see that political tool in these three graphs. I'll just show quickly. Um, you see in the first one the Reserve Bank of Australia's balance sheet as a percentage of GDP, and you can see how it increased from 2020. Uh, you can see a different reflection of that in terms of the total assets of the RBA in the next graph, and then contrast that with the, uh, the interest rates and how they've collapsed. You know, <laughs> you would think that that money would help grow our economy. Well, sorry, well, no, it, it, it doesn't won't. because, yeah, we're not directing the credit as we could be doing into the productive yeah. sector. Instead, we're shutting our productive sector down. We've financialised our economy. You can read an article in the this week's Australian Alert Service about how Lebanon's economy was completely financialised to the point where a country of nearly 7 million people or around 7 million people has the second largest, proportionally largest banking sector in the world compared to their GDP. Um, and now it's in complete crisis with power shut off for 20 hours a day, you can't get food and medical supplies um, because the banking sector controls and dictates everything. Um, now that being said, we do want to talk more about the solutions and we want to move on to our next topic, which is our weapon in the war on cash, um, because we want to focus here a little bit on how the public banking solution is actually has come to life in an incredible way around the world. We've talked about it on various shows, so we're not going to recover, recover all of that ground. But I wanted to refer to a Reserve Bank of Australia report that came out in June called How Far Do Australians Need to Travel to Access Cash? Because as our long-term viewers would know, um, we've talked uh, and fought over the years the campaign to ban large cash transactions as a stepping stone to ban cash altogether. Um, now, this RBA report concludes that access to cash services in Australia remains generally good. <laughs> now, that's provisionally... not because of the banks. No, it's provisionally true that they can say that, but it's only because of post offices and the fact that it is enshrined in Australian law that postal access has to be maintained for every community. If the Australia Post was privatised, that is gone. That's all up for grabs and there would be no access. So the report says that 95% of Australians are closer to cash access at their local post office than at a bank branch or ATM. Uh, and it says the reduction in bank branches over the past few years in particular means that bank at post outlets have become more important at filling in the gaps and providing access to cash to cash deposit functionality in particular. And to just depict that, I want to show some graphs. Um, this is a, a graphic showing all Australia Post branches. So you can see the spread of them because of that uh, regulation requiring them to provide postal access. And then you can see in the next graph, uh, these. this is from the RBA report where they're showing the areas with the least access to cash and that's all the yellow areas. So you might not be able to see the detail, but the capital cities basically uh, the little white areas and then spreading out, radiating out from that are all the yellow areas which increasingly have less access to cash. But then in this next graph you see Australia Post outlets more than 50 kilometres from the nearest bank br branch um, where you can see that that 
critical access for people to banking services is only provided by Australia Post. And this um, next graph shows how, this is what the RBA is saying, that while um, the banks or ADIs, Australia Deposit Institutions, the points of presence have declined you know, significantly, as you see, particularly from about 2008, 2009 downwards, branches have declined. Bank at post has had an increase, but then it's remained consistently level, and that's the critical thing here. Mm. Uh, and I want to show another graph, which is during the campaign we ran, uh, Craig, to uh, save Australia Post from privatisation and to reinstate Holgate as she revived the institution. It was being run down so that they'd have the excuse to privatise it. We got flyers out across the country to local post offices, and this is a map showing our distribution. And we're now building upon that campaign with a resolution that we want everyone to take to their local council. And we'll put information, you can click on the little I button to go to our web page to find that resolution. Take it to your local council. Um, you, all you need is one councillor to say, I'll table it, and then they'll vote on it. And based on the response we get, mm. we want to map that and begin to build that grassroots support um, for uh, a, a public postal bank. We've got the legislation ready to go, the Commonwealth Postal Bank legislation. We are hoping to get that tabled in the next session of Parliament or as soon as we can and let the fight begin. You know, this is absolutely something people can get involved in. It's your post office. It's your, you know, your access to cash. The banks are going to pull out more and more as the economy, you know, tightens up because we're actually in a crash, in, you, as you've seen with this quantitative easing attempt and so forth. They're going to protect their profits. So what public banking does, Elisa, it protects the, 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 the public good, the interests of the public first and foremost, not the private profits of the private banking system. And that's the fight that we're in. So if people want to have access to cash, access to decent um, you know, postal services, first of all, they've got to help support the post offices by having a postal bank mm. and that's what our campaign is. And a lot of people support it. Yeah, and you can just a note, side note on that, um, the, Com the great Commonwealth Bank of Australia, when it acted as a national bank for the nation, started in the post office branches and we'll put a link. It didn't it, start off with quantitative easing. Absolutely <laughs> not. We'll put a little link up so you can access this article on our website, which was in the Australian Alert Service, on how those Commonwealth Bank branches started in the post offices and you know even had branches operating in rail cars on the rail lines and things like that when we were building this country. So it's a completely different orientation. But also what you're saying is summarised beautifully in uh, this video that I want to show, which is uh, from the Public Banking Institute, founded by um, quite famous um, author and former attorney Ellen Brown. Um, yeah, it, just watch this. All across the country, from Maine to Hawaii, Alaska to Florida, California to New York, people are taking back their power from Wall Street by calling for public banks. We want New York City to take our public dollars out of those banks. Yeah. Yeah. We want All New it. York City to put that money in a public bank. Why do we need to have to go to Wall Street? about our basic needs and necessities of life. Enter public banking, a bank owned by our local government. All across the country, public banking movements are arising. From Los Angeles to San Francisco, to Seattle, to Washington, D.C., the state of New Jersey, the state of Michigan, to New York City and Alexandria's home state. We are witnessing the emergence of an idea whose time has come. Yes. <laughs> Ever since Ellen Brown reintroduced the idea of public banking to the United States in 2011, the idea has inspired more and more people. So it would behoove our state and local governments to set up their own banks right now, just if only to keep their deposits safe and leverage your funds into credit for your local community. Imagine a bank whose sole purpose is to make sure that the economy is stronger. That's what a public bank can do. Traditionally, the city of Chicago pays hundreds of millions of dollars in fees and fines and interest rates to traditional financial institutions. And we have to wonder what is the return on that investment. A public bank actually recirculates dollars back into the city's economy. With a public bank, there is accountability 
and there's transparency. Elected officials and advocates now realize it makes much more sense to cut out the Wall Street middleman by owning their own bank. So some people say, why do we need a public bank? Let's be very clear. Private corporations are not meant to do the business of public good, which is why we need a public bank. One of the bills that I want to draw particular attention is my bill to create a publicly owned state bank of Washington. So the state of Washington's bank account is at the Bank of America. We have a better use for our resources. Why don't we create our own publicly owned bank, owned by us, the taxpayers, and then we can keep our tax money in Washington State and working for Washington State. I'm a big believer in something called the public bank. So here's the idea. All those deposits come on home. They reside in the People's Bank of New Jersey, owned by the citizens. We don't need Washington to form a public bank. You can do it here. The state can do it. States, cities, counties, all across America can do this. With a public bank, a city or state can extend credit to themselves at low interest rates, pay themselves back, and keep the profits in the community. By borrowing money at a fraction of what we borrow it at now, that would really be the biggest help. When the crash hit, the Bank of North Dakota never blinked and the credit kept flowing. We can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big boys. I think that money should be a public utility, um, not a means of further consolidating wealth. The idea is motivating. Since 2017, over 26 states and municipalities have introduced new public bank legislation. More than 50 grassroots groups are working across the country. So today we are talking to all of the signatures. We've got 40,000 signatures in support in this motion, and that we want to move towards a public banking system that is for the Carlos, what are you doing? Carlos, get in! Hey! I'm live streaming, folks! Yeah! Hey! Yes, I'm coming! Hey, yes, I'm coming! Yes, I'm coming! Yes, I'm Yes, I'm coming! Yes, in California, over 150 organizations in over a dozen major cities and counties have voted to support the Public Banking Act, AB 857, which makes it possible for cities to set up their own public banks. Through the hard work of advocates and sponsors, the bill has passed the Assembly and two Senate committees. News outlets are paying attention. This success has inspired New York State to introduce a similar bill, S5565, giving New York's cities a pathway to their own public banks. Join the movement. Go to publicbankinginstitute.org. And you see there they mentioned the Bank of North Dakota, which is the longest continuing functioning public bank, quite famous um, in the 2020, March 2020 crisis. Mm. They had the least impact on the real economy because they kept uh, the money flowing through, working with local banks and with local institutions in the economy. Um, so that was quite notable. Lisa, we've, we've got a tremendously rich history of public banking in our country. I mean, the Commonwealth Bank saved our country from the Great Depression. Well, could have could have saved our country from the Great Depression, but it wasn't done so. But it did save us from having to uh, have private banks profit from World War II. It actually funded our development of the uh, munitions necessary to fight World War II. And it's a tremendous institution. It was shut down, it was privatised, it got rid of because it was a threat to the private banking system. Now we go through that in our pamphlet, or the, our booklet there, and people really need to know. What we're talking about with this postal bank campaign is building upon generations of, un, of what actually has happened in our country in the past. So you need to educate yourself about that. We do have some videos about this I've, I've, you know, on the YouTube mm. channel, so people should look at that. Yeah, so get in contact for a free copy of the alert service if you haven't already or to subscribe and get regularly informed. Don't forget to like and share the video. That's all we've got time for this week. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Benjamin Pierce, editor of The Citizen's Report. You may have noticed that our videos are not monetized on this channel. This is because we are not here to peddle a product for financial gain. We use YouTube as a platform to build the movement necessary to face and overcome the political and economic challenges facing our nation. We need you to help in this fight. In addition to what we discuss in this show, you can help spread the word by liking this video, subscribing to the channel, 
Be sure to ring the bell so that you receive notifications when our latest videos go live and share the video with friends on as many social media platforms as you are able. Also actively engage in the comment section and share your thoughts on the issues we present. Thank you.